Welcome to the People Who Read People podcast. I'm your host, Zachary Elwood. On this podcast, I interview people from different professions and walks of life about how they attempt to understand human behavior. If you'd like to learn more about this podcast, go to readingpokertells.video for episode summaries and links. In this episode, recorded December 17th, 2020, I interview Gina Asaf, whose last name is spelled A-S-S-A-F, about her use of the internet to collect data to study the long-term effects and symptoms of COVID. Ms. Asaf is a technology consultant based in Washington, D.C. In March of 2020, she got COVID, and since then, she's experienced long-term effects from it, including exhaustion and cognitive impairment. She became a member in a COVID sufferer online group, and frustrated with the lack of answers, she decided to launch her own research effort to gather data about COVID long haulers, which is the informal name given to people suffering from long-term effects of COVID. She worked with several scientists and survey designers. For their first survey effort, they gathered responses from 640 people. The first paper they produced was titled, An Analysis of the Prolonged COVID-19 Symptoms Survey by Patient-Led Research Team. If you search Gina Asaf's name online, you'll find many articles about her COVID work. One article is titled, COVID-19 Long Haulers Take Symptom Research into Own Hands. I'll read a little bit from a New York Times article from September 2020. Gina Asaf, a consultant in Washington, D.C., who helped write Body Politics Report, said that by week six of her COVID-19 course, her doctor asked if her symptoms could be bad allergies. That felt like gaslighting, Ms. Ossoff said. Her friends were dubious of her lingering symptoms. I stopped talking about it with a lot of my friends, Ms. Ossoff said, because it felt like they couldn't understand. End quote. And here's a quote about long-term COVID effects from Anthony Fauci. Anecdotally, there's no question that there are a considerable number of individuals who have a post-viral syndrome that really, in many respects, can incapacitate them for weeks and weeks following so-called recovery and clearing of the virus, end quote. One reason I was interested in this topic is that I've suffered from the mysterious condition called chronic fatigue syndrome, aka myalgic encephalomyelitis. In 2015, I went from being in the best physical shape of my life to it being an effort to do anything physical and feeling like my muscles were burning when I exercised and feeling pain just from pressing a finger lightly into my arm or leg. I also had some cognitive impairment, so much so that for a while I didn't feel safe driving or doing other activities that required strong mental focus. I felt like I had some sort of flu almost every day. If you'd like to read more about my experiences, you can go to a website I created at cfs-me-network.com. There I have a blog post about my experiences and also an interview I did with Dr. Nancy Klemus, a respected chronic fatigue syndrome researcher. So to bring this back to COVID, chronic fatigue syndrome symptoms bear some similarity to the long-term COVID symptoms Gina and others have been suffering from. And one of the theories of how chronic fatigue syndrome may start in some people is that it's a reaction to a viral infection. With my chronic fatigue syndrome experiences, I was frustrated by the lack of answers. And due to that frustration, I wanted to create some sort of data collection project. It felt like there was some low-hanging fruit in terms of interesting correlations one could find with a good questionnaire and a large data set of responders. But to make a long story short, around the two-year mark after my symptoms started, things improved significantly for me. I was able to exercise again and felt much better. I still do have some physical effects, but I felt pretty close to normal otherwise. Apparently, it's pretty common for people with chronic fatigue syndrome to improve substantially around the two-year mark. While that was great for me, that improvement also sapped my motivation to work on that project. If you want to learn more about my brainstorming for that data gathering project, That work is also on the site cfs-me-network.com. But in general, I still see so much theoretical opportunity in gathering large data sets from the public and looking for correlations, not just for mysterious conditions like CFS, but for getting insights into all conditions, for how symptom sets vary across different populations or how different population traits might make some people respond better to one treatment versus another, things like that. It just seems like there's a lot of room for more data gathering and intelligent use of that data. If you're interested in these topics, you might like the last podcast episode before this one, where I interview Jamie Haywood, the co-founder of Patients Like Me, which is a platform for collecting medical data directly from the public. So to bring it back to Gina Asaf and her COVID research, sometimes the people suffering from a condition can help with research in unique ways. The people suffering from a condition are motivated to find answers for one thing, And they often know more about how a condition manifests than the more removed researchers or doctors do. They think of questions to ask and avenues of research that might otherwise be overlooked or not focused on. 
You can find Gina on Twitter at Gina Ossoff, G-I-N-A-A-S-S-A-F. And you can find her COVID research team on Twitter at PatientLED, that's Patient L-E-D. One note about this interview, it was edited a bit more than usual due to me asking some bad questions. So if the interview seems a bit choppy, that's my fault and not Gina's. Okay, here's the interview with Gina Ossoff. All right, thanks for coming on the show, Gina. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I've read that you were diagnosed with COVID and have had some of the long-term effects related to that. Is it accurate to say that you were motivated to work in this area out of your frustration with uh, not getting answers and the slowness of traditional medical research? Yes, that is correct. I mean, I think it was, you know, in, when we got sick, a lot of us, and, and we're still sick, you know, the long haulers, especially the ones, early phase ones, we were, you know, I was one of, maybe one of the first people in, in March in D.C., um, phase that, you know, got sick and, you know, I, I did not get better and no doctors had answers for me. And so that motivated us. And and I think, you know, there was research happening and, and coming out about COVID, but it wasn't focused on the long haulers because we were not seen as urgent or acute or, um, you know, needed urgent attention. So we were basically um, motivated. I was very motivated to, to understand what was happening with me. I, was, I wasn't satisfied with the answers I was getting from medical providers and what I was hearing in the media. So definitely. And this kind of reminds me of the uh, chronic fatigue syndrome situation where there's so many people that don't feel well served by the traditional medical community. And uh, to name one example, I'm, I'm sure there's many other examples, but do you see an overlap there of a, of a group of people that have you know, have a problem that are not being uh, Yes, yes, well 100%. The, yeah. 100%. I mean, I think we were became aware of them, you know, that group uh, once we released our first report and we were contacted by MECFS community, um, the chronic fatigue syndrome um, and, uh, you know, the folks who had typically been, you know, under um, researched and, 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 you know, not much um, medical attention on that, on that group of uh, people. And so that was, uh, you know, one positive side to this is like bringing more attention to that with some of the you know the the large attention that COVID has gotten, and and I mean it is it is it is probably because there's a large number of us that got sick all around the same time, um, and so yeah, I mean definitely I saw a lot of the the analogies and a lot of similar misattention and and non frustration you know, frustration you know lack of research lack of answers. Uh, even even some of the doctors, you know, now are telling us that as well. Hey, you know, you're it's, this is similar to that disease or to that post viral. There's some other post viral stuff we don't know a lot about, and so definitely, right. There are theories that chronic fatigue syndrome, aka you know, ME, myalgic encephalomyelitis, mm -hmm. are, are are a post viral condition that we don't fully understand, but it's could be related to for a lot of people to a past viral infection. Yep, that's true. Can you talk a little bit about what makes your research unique? You know, other than the fact that it's crowdsourced, because, is that I think that made this unique, the work that we did was, you know, it was led by people that, you know, were, were um, driven and had the same concerns as the people that you're collecting the data from. So, you know, I call this participatory research where, and in our case, it was patient-led research. So we were able to identify what we thought was important. We were, you know, part of the community. So they trusted that we, the data that we were going to collect was to give back to the community and analyze and, and give results. Because a lot of times researchers will take the data and they don't give it back to the population that wants to understand themselves and understand what's happening, right? Um, and, and make some, you know, conclusions about it. And so we're also doing that, right? We're providing information back to the community um, you know, that's fast and, and, and answering some questions that we all have as, as, as people, you know, going through the same thing. Um, and so that to me is like the biggest, um, you know, the be biggest benefit is that you're trying to address and find problems that, you know, the, the rest of the community has similar to you, right? And because you're facing all the same thing. Um, and so you're focusing on, on the things that, you know, people would want you to focus on. And, and so it's not as extractive as typical re other research is. It's more like you're doing the research and you're um, and bringing it back to the community and you're focusing on the areas that are important to the community. And yeah, it's fa it can be fast, um, and, you know, depending, you know, I mean, I think the speed and all that stuff can, you can, you know, argue it could go both ways. Some, some researchers might be fast and be able to get back, you know, do the analysis quickly. But the question is, what do they do with the data? And the other question is like, you know, what questions are they looking into? Are those questions that the community is looking into? 
Now, for, for us, I mean, I think when we were collecting the data for, for our second survey, we aggregated the questions and, 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 you know, kind of like designed the survey as patients understanding what is important, what are, what are some, you know, things that we have been talking about in our community. For example, I'll give you one example. Brain fog is a term that we've been using in our group that, you know, maybe is not like a medical term, right? But uh, it's definitely something that we've been experiencing. I mean, many people in our Slack group have been talking about it. So we were able to, to, as patients, dissect that further and drill down into it and try to understand it. What does it mean? And so, you know, I think there's power to that because, you know, otherwise, as a, if you're going to be a medical researcher, you might not be like asking about things that you don't understand, but you're not feeling yourself. One criticism I've seen in this area is of the longer term tracking projects, the, the ones that require patients, people to continue filling out their status. And one problem there is that people tend to stop reporting for various reasons, like maybe they get better or they just get tired of using the app or whatever. So is it fair to say that single one-time surveys are maybe more practically useful or at least less subject to criticism than the more long-term tracking projects, or do you have any opinions in in that area? Yeah, I mean that's a you know really good question, and I actually had this conversation earlier with a with a company that we're talking to, an org that is um, you know kind of designed an app, and and they you know kind of were talking to us about partnering with collecting data. Bec- and and I think there's two use cases that I think are you know different use cases. One is you know you're doing retrospective data, um, you know entering data. Um, and the benefits to that is, yeah, it's one time, it's easier to get the attention of the people, but there's some recall bias with that, especially if you're trying to, you know, get data from the past, you know, people might not remember accurately, but the benefit of that is, yeah, they're most likely going to fill it all out and they're not going to, you know, you're, you don't have to rely on them coming back. But on the other hand, you know, if you want data that is accurately representing time-based um, information, then yeah, having like an app or a reoccurring survey is something that would probably be better for the data data you're collecting, but it's going to be harder from a behavioral perspective. And this is where I think, you know, design and UX can play a kind of a large role in like, how do you get people to continuously update? And, you know, one of the things that, you know, we've been thinking about is if you're, if the, what you're presenting back to the patient is useful and you're kind of, you know, giving them data continuously, there's probably more likelihood of them updating and providing input on a more continuous basis. But I think it has to be done, you know, very carefully, you know, in a way that is like really considering behavioral patterns and, and what makes people motivated to, to do things over and over. I'm curious how your experience and past and user experience uh, UI design has played a role in in your work. How how do you see UX design in general playing a role in in this industry? Because it seems like you say it's very important to have a pleasant experience, one that's easy to use, et cetera. My background in UX and design, all my research methodologies and backgrounds come from you know my my strong background in in UX and and research, uh, um, understanding how to do how to ask the right questions, and even survey design. You know, I, I learned that all through my, you know, my master's program and, and then through, through my work, I create surveys. I, I know how to ask questions in the right way. And so that definitely um, helps with, um, you know, the work that we did in, in terms of like designing a survey that was easy to fill out, but also going to accurately represent the research that we need. So that definitely was helpful. And also, I mean, you know, like, yeah, the participatory research methods, thinking about like doing this in a way that respects people's, um, the rest of the community, what they want out of this research and that sort of thing. Back to the, you know, your, your previous question, it, it, you know, it's, it also helps um, me think about uh, if we do want to do a continuous uh, data entry process where we're gathering data over time, what's the best way of doing this? And this is where UX and design comes into play, thinking about, um, you know, what are some patterns that we could use there in interaction design and in UX that may uh, uh, best serve the, the users that will be entering the data. It seems like there's so many factors involving the UX. Like, for example, you know, I'm sure we've all taken online surveys where it's hard to go back and change your response on a previous page. So it seems like, you know, all of those things lead to little frustrations, you know, like the or the notif- notifications you get if it's not easy to get to the survey, they, little things like that. It just seems like, yeah, that there's this big overlap of, of having great design, which leads to better data. Yep, for sure. For sure. And I mean, I think definitely being a UX designer, I'm a researcher as well. So that experience, you know, really helped to the work that I'm, I'm, we're doing here with the, the COVID um, patient research. You mentioned something that's 
I've always been interested in as a, as a writer, how you phrase survey questions, because I'm sure we've all also taken surveys that where you're like, that question is just really bad. I don't even know how to answer that. And the worse your questions are, the, the worse the data is going to be. So I'm curious, uh, and you mentioned taking classes for, for that kind of survey questionnaire creation. What, what happens in the area for people trying to learn more about that? Yeah, well, I mean, I think, so it wasn't really particularly like a survey design. I'm sure there, might, I'm sure there is. But I think it's just the the whole process and the methodology of designing interfaces, mm-hmm. um, you know, that lends itself to survey design as well. I mean, it's the same process when you're, you know, if you're designing a web form for like a website versus like, a, you know, a survey that's trying to do research and gather data. Right. Just UX um, writing it's in a general. Similar process. Yeah, just, just clean, efficient UX writing. Yeah. Yeah. UX writing and UX, you know, designing of screens and, and, and that sort of thing. Right. So it's all kind of the same, similar um, things that you have to think about. And I'm sure it's a tough area because I've seen very respected medical research questionnaires where I was like, oh, that's that's a tough question to understand. And then then you factor in like people having different language backgrounds and things like that. And how do they interpret that same question? So there's never a perfect way to implement it. It's more like you just try to make it as as good as you can with whatever yeah, experience you have. Then also one of, one of the most important things to do is do usability testing of your survey. Um, and so that's something you know I always do is, is you run your you run your survey in a, in a user test um, environment where you have you watch the patient or the respondent go through your survey and think out loud as they um, take it and then that helps you understand how understandable it is. I um, mean, so you do that with a you know good amount of um, test uh, you know participants, um, and that's that's a good way to kind of improve on your survey before you really sit out in the wild. Getting back to the specific COVID research, have there been uh, surprises that you've found? We'll be releasing this soon, so I can say, like, seeing that I think it was 85% of people are, are you know, having cognitive impairments from long, with long COVID. That's, you know, a big number. There's also a big number of people that, you know, are experiencing this thing called, um, you know, which I, you know, kind of suspected, but I didn't realize, you know, from our group, it's really high in, in our survey respondents that are fatigue and post-exertional malaise, which is like anytime they do any effort, they, um, you know, kind of um, have some rebound of ish relapses and, and things like that. Also, you know, seeing that it's impacting all ages and and all, uh, you know, different kinds of groups. I always say with the research, you know, you're, you're not going to see maybe extreme surprises. It's more that it'll just make things clearer, you know, to you. And like, it's like, you know, when you put on glasses, everything is like foggy and you just put on glasses, you can see it more clearly. And, um, and I think that's what the research did for us. It just like made some things clearer to us. When speaking of the cognitive impairments and post-exertional malaise, I mean, those are the some of the main symptom sets of uh, chronic yep. fatigue syndrome slash ME. So that's that's interesting. I mean, and are more and more people thinking that these that this might be evidence that CFS is a post viral uh, condition? What we're we're saying is that there probably is going to be a group that is uh, a big group of the long COVID patients that are CFS, and uh, and this yeah definitely shows that it's a post viral thing potentially that happens and it's happening in a bigger, wider, in a larger number because COVID is hitting so many more people. Um, but then there are some other groups of people that that it's not. It looks like within the data set, we have different, you know, kinds of groups of people that are experiencing this. But it definitely seems like there's a large group that very similar to ME-CFS. Yeah, it seems even with, uh, even if you're able to c- criticize a, a specific data set gathered this way, like s- say, even if you thought it was a little bit weak, it just seems like the strengths of being able to get ideas for further research, you know, that alone is exactly. so huge, you know, just the ability to to look for correlations and ideas for research. Exactly. You know, I think when I first started, you know, I first created the first survey, that was my thought. It was, this is going to be, this is insightful for us just so we can learn from each other. But this is, you know, can help guide other research was my, you know, my initial thinking. I mean, but, you know, it, it's been way more than that. I mean, people have referenced our research, the CDC referred to it and on their website. Mm-hmm. So, it, you know, it's been more than just, you know, kind of guiding new research. But I, that was the initial thought, I think, when I, when I was, I remember when I was initially creating the survey was, you know, this will at the minimum. Worst case help, scenario. Yeah. yeah, will help like right. give, you know, hints to doing other research sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And to, to clarify, yeah, you're, you're having people respect your data, which is, which is awesome. Which is, yeah. Which is great. Yeah. yeah. 
So is there anything else you'd uh, like to talk about that I haven't touched on? You know, I think you covered, uh, you know, quite a bit. Um, you know, I think, you know, with this research, we've uh, showed the value of patient-led research, and I hope there's more of it that comes out because of this. Hopefully, you know, we'll be sharing more of like, you know, lessons learned and that sort of thing from our group. This has been Gina Asaf. Thanks a lot for joining me. This has been a very educational talk, and thanks so much for your work. Sure thing. Thanks for having me. This has been the People Who Read People podcast. If you'd like to learn more about this podcast, go to readingpokertells.video slash blog to see episode summaries and links. If you like this interview, you might like another recent interview I did on medical and health-related topics with Jamie Haywood, co-founder of Patients Like Me. We talk about the benefits and challenges of collecting medical data directly from the public. I make no money from this podcast and I spend quite a bit of time on it. So if you'd like to do me a favor, please share episodes you like on social media and give me a review on iTunes. If you'd like to send me a financial donation, I'm on Patreon at patreon.com slash Zach Elwood, Z-A-C-H-E-L-W-O-O-D. And if you want to send money via PayPal, my email address is info at readingpokertells.com. Thanks for listening. Music by Small Skies.